Hello, so today I want to talk about authoritarianism and what we mean in political science whenever we talk about authoritarianism and authoritarian regimes. Authoritarian regimes cover a broad spectrum of types of government and can include traditionally absolute monarchies, forms of military rule, um, some would still be classified as democracies and albeit very flawed democracies and of course also cover dictatorships. Both left and right wing uh, regimes can be authoritarian. Um, I think it's easier to spot sometimes with right wing regimes but you do get it sometimes with left wing regimes as well. So authoritarianism is primarily a system characterised by the repression of opposition um, to the government or to the ruling party and repression of political liberty. It's a style of rule in which political rule is imposed on society. So ironically, it's very different from authority, which is the right to rule and implies consent and legitimacy, as we've seen earlier. So it is rule which is imposed on society regardless of consent. And even where there are elections and in regimes, a style of authoritarian regime which is referred to as competitive authoritarianism, there will often be elections and those elections are used to justify um, whoever's in power and then further to justify the policies they bring in because they can claim to have an electoral mandate for those policies. So where there are elections, they're often rigged or they are not free and fair elections in the sense that you would expect in a true democracy. They can favour the ruling party. They can allow for little opportunity for regime change. And one of the characteristics of an authoritarian system is that there is little opportunity for regime change. Authoritarianism was the dominant form of political uh, rule really up until the 18th or 19th centuries. And even in the early democracies that emerged, there's still quite a, a, an autocratic bent, if you like. And I think this partly explains why authoritarianism um, can be so readily accepted. There's a, a tendency to accept authoritarianism in particular political cultures that's very noted. Um, but we all at one point have experienced authoritarian rule, historically speaking. So therefore there's an element of uh, people being used to certain aspects of authoritarian rule, which means that as democracies become more authoritarian, um, the early signs can be ignored. And particularly if people don't really understand why some of the features, uh, for example, some of the things that we've talked about before as being necessary features of a democracy, if people don't understand why they're necessary or how that works or you know, why there might be a problem if that goes, then it's hard to muster up a, a lot of opposition. You get a small group of people, maybe academics, people from political groups saying, this is wrong, this is going to be bad for all of society. And unfortunately, unless everybody else can see that, then that will just go ahead and that will be the first step uh, along a very dangerous path away from democracy. So we see authoritarianism today in lots of different countries. It's not unusual to see authoritarian forms of rule. When first studying this, very often students will look towards dictatorships and say, well, dictatorships are authoritarian and, and by their nature, dictatorships do tend to be authoritarian. But we do see authoritarian systems which are somewhere between dictatorships and democracies. And they're slightly... Um, harder to pinpoint and we need to really clear up what are the features at what point can we say this regime is no longer a democracy but is an authoritarian regime what are the traits that we would expect to see uh, to be able to make that judgment call so the traits on of authoritarian regimes again to confuse the issue some of these traits can be seen in democracies some of the time Okay, so that is why I think in the early days with an emerging authoritarian regime, it's a slow process, it's a gradual process, and it's a process which, to be fair, um, can be easily missed um, if you're not really on top of the sort of the theory and understand the way things can go. So newly emerging authoritarian leaders or newly emer emerging authoritarian uh, governments can disguise their initial moves. 
um, and very often will use a real or a manufactured crisis to help that along. So it makes it more acceptable. Um, it is used to justify the removal of, say, civil liberties or the imposition of um, you know, some sort of restrictions or emergency powers on the citizens. So a crisis can really help an authoritarian leader. And if there isn't a crisis, they're very adept at uh, creating one and using control of the media to really ramp that up to get support for whatever it is they want to bring in. Key traits of an authoritarian regime then. Restrictions on civil and political liberties. Now, it's important to realise we're saying restrictions. This does not mean that there's a complete absence of civil and political liberties, which might be more the case with a, a pure dictatorship. The fact that there are still some civil and political li uh, liberties means, of course, that anybody who still feels like they've got the protection of the state will tend to be blind to the extent to which other groups do not have that protection and maybe not sympathetic. Now we've seen that in, for example, I mean one of the case studies we would use for this is Russia and we've seen in Putin's Russia definitely a removal of civil liberties for certain groups and these are groups that are easily targeted because they're minority groups or because in a particular culture they're groups that lack support anyway in wider society and therefore if you start to remove rights from those groups, if you target those groups, if you take away the protection of the law for those groups, um, in a way many authoritarian regimes are doing a trial run to see how much they can get away with before they then expand that out to other groups. Um, certainly I think that one of the things that often gets forgotten about is that if you live in a regime like this and you do sit back and you watch other groups lose their rights, it's a mistake to think that that won't end up at your own door or to somebody close to you sooner or later. So the removal of civil and political liberties. Um, there's a strengthening of the role of the executive. It nearly goes without saying. It's an authoritarian regime by means of the fact that it's got a strong centralised government. There's, there's what we would consider in a democracy as too much power on the government. Remember, in a democracy, the reason that we think that government should be held to account is to prevent the abuse of power. It's to prevent tyranny. It's to make sure that good laws are passed that serve the greatest number. Um, a government that has too much power and has unbridled power doesn't have those same restrictions. So uh, strengthening role of the executive. Now, it's important to remember also that a lot of authoritarian regimes, particularly if they're emerging from democracy and moving on that sliding scale uh, towards authoritarianism, will still have elections, will still have uh, an elected parliament and in fact will in many ways still look like laws are made by the parliament but in fact if you unpack that you'll find that disproportionate power lies with the executive and the executive has the final say and there might be issues with elections too which we'll talk about in a moment. Okay so they strengthen the role of the executive. Um, authoritarian regimes that um, are developing will also very often bring in new um, constitutional um, positions, constitutional laws that will help to strengthen the hand of the executive. So it will all be done legally, um, which again misleads people into thinking um, how safe it is. So it's been done legally, if there's been a referendum, for example, our other case study would be uh, Turkey with Erdogan. Um, Erdogan had a referendum in 2017 following a failed coup in Turkey in 2016, of dubious source, you know, we're not sure to what extent that coup uh, was orchestrated or wasn't orchestrated, but whatever, Erdogan turned it into an opportunity to go to the people of Turkey and say, we need to move away from the style of government we have here to a more presidential style of government. We need to have a strong leader, uh, and that strong leader was obviously going to be him. So he was able to change constitutionally the power of the executive in Turkey through that referendum and can legitimately then claim a degree of legal rational authority for doing that. But of course that then set in motion a number of things which people hadn't anticipated which we'll talk about uh, in a, a little minute or two. The next thing that is a key figure or feature of authoritarian regimes is uh, oppression by the state or the government uh, of government opponents and that can be oppression of 
political parties, the members of the other political parties. Um, it can be outright oppression. Um, it can be harassing them. It can be trying to make it difficult for them to stand elections. We see that a lot in Russia. It can be accusing them of, again, we see this in Russia, accusing them of things that are nothing to do with politics, not going out and arguing about your policies are wrong or, you know, any of that type of thing, but actually accusing them of fraud or, you know, trying to get them um, really to get them involved with the criminal justice system and to use a judicial system to shut down anybody who might be an opponent. So oppression of state or government um, opponents is another feature. Linked to that is control of the media and control not only of the media very often and again in Russia we do see that a lot of the media is owned by uh, oligarchs who are sympathetic to the regime or who at least are forced to be sympathetic to the regime and it means you don't have that free press, you don't have that proper questioning of the government. Um, remember the, the role of a free press in a democracy is to hold the government's toes to the fire, it's to say well, why did you do this? And why didn't you do this other thing? They are the voice very often uh, of the people um, in between election times. And therefore, it's very important for a free press to exist and to be able to ask questions about government policies. And um, what you find in authoritarian regimes is that either the media is owned in such a way that those questions are unlikely to be asked, although there are elements of that in lots of democracies too, I've got to say, but that even more than that, that there are restrictions on what can be discussed. So you start to find that journalists like political opponents will also be arrested, will also be detained, will also be harassed, and will know that by publishing certain articles that they are putting themselves in a difficult position, which certainly makes it much harder to do their job. Um, the criminal justice system then, often in authoritarian regimes, uh, doesn't operate the way that it does in a democracy. There isn't a rule of law, although the rule of law is flawed in most democracies. I mean, it's a, a misnomer to say that the law is applied equally to everybody. We all know lots of situations where, in fact, that can be questioned. However, there is at least a commitment to try to do that. There is the provision of judicial review for citizens who feel they have been unfairly treated by the state of our state agency. In an authoritarian regime, there is no uh, ability to do that. Law is applied in a very partisan way. And you know that it, <coughs> excuse me, if you are accused of something that is in any way critical of the government, that you are likely um, to be repressed and that you cannot hope that the courts would help you there. Okay, so they are the features of an authoritarian regime. Now, we've mentioned two authoritarian regimes and they're not the only authoritarian regimes and they're not the only regimes that students can refer to. Um, I think because they're fairly recent emerged uh, authoritarian regimes, I think that they're good examples um, and they're interesting and also because it avoids using the same examples that perhaps would be used uh, for uh, more comparison of dictatorship. It's good to get away from that. Um, in the world today, if you look at the uh, data sheets that are available if you search the internet and you can have a look at the list of democracies, authoritarian regimes, you will see that many regimes meet the criteria for authoritarianism and there's some really excellent articles on those. So the two that I've talked about here are Turkey and Russia. In Turkey, um, the leader is Erdogan. Erdogan's an elected leader, like I've mentioned, who used a referendum to increase powers, to create a more presidential role, to centralise the powers. Like we mentioned, you would have an authoritarian regime. There was a failed coup, so there was that state of emergency where he could say, oh, we need to do this. We need to make things stronger. Let's see how we can do this. Um, there was a crackdown immediately after that on all forms of opposition both political opposition, but also then, and I think many uh, Turkish people who voted in that referendum didn't realise this on academia. So academics within the universities who had been at any time critical of Erdogan and his party were removed from post. That then the same thing was rolled out against the media and against journalists. Um, there was an erosion of checks and balances. There was an erosion of separation of powers. These are all things, again, that we associate with um, you know, maintaining democracy. And in common with other modern authoritarian regimes, Turkey um, really is a good example of a corrupted liberal democracy where Turkey had been very firmly in the sort of democratic genre, but has now moved very much towards a corrupted liberal democracy into the authoritarian 
uh, genre and power is centralised now around one person and one party. The other example is Russia, and Russia is a great example of competitive authoritarianism. There are elections in Russia, but these elections aren't fair. Um, they have the appearance of being uh, democratic elections. However, the political campaigns of opposition parties are oppressed. Major candidates are hounded and harassed uh, until they withdraw from the elections. Civil liberties in Russia are haphazardly uh, respected. So some people have their civil liberties respected, others don't, and nobody's quite sure when their civil liberties might be eroded. Uh, the rule of law doesn't exist. You can't say the rule of law exists whenever the law is applied in a partisan manner, and that is certainly the case in Russia today. And the media is in control, uh, in the control, sorry, of those in power. And uh, so there is no free press, and that again reduces any opportunity to criticise the government. So the key thing, really, with authoritarianism is to understand that it it can um, emerge and exist around the edges of a democratic state. So a state that's starting to find its democracy sliding, starting to find an erosion of key democratic features, is in danger. Of moving towards authoritarianism. If you throw in a party that has an authoritarian aim uh, with a leader who may or may not be populist but who believes that uh, in authoritarian rule, if you're in a political culture which is predisposed to authoritarianism because of authoritarian forms of rule in the past and then you have a major crisis, you have all the ingredients for an authoritarian regime to emerge. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.